Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad as we greet you with Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu on this day, uh, Yawmul Ahad, the first day of the week. Uh, from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network uh, here in my Caribbean island of Trinidad. Uh, wherever you may be in the world or even here in Trinidad, um, we greet you uh, once more with the Signs of the Times uh, lectures, uh, which are broadcast live, live streaming on ibntt.com and also on YouTube at IBN Master, IBN Master. Uh, today we uh, have an announcement for you on, about my new book. Uh, you see the cover on the screen just now. Uh, Dajjal or the Antichrist, uh, the False Messiah, Dajjal, uh, the Quran, and uh, Akhirul Zaman or the beginning of, uh, sorry, Dajjal, the Qur'an, and Awwalu Zaman, or the beginning of history. Um, the book is now completed, alhamdulillah. We're doing just some touching up. And <laughs> it will soon go to the print tree for printing. It's also being, uh, here we are on the screen. It's also being translated right away to French. So it will be published both in English and in French. Uh, inshallah, this is the first of five books I'm writing on the subject of uh, Dajjal. Uh, the first one is Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwal zaman or the beginning of history. The second one, which I'm working on now, is from Jesus, the true Messiah, to Dajjal, the false Messiah, a journey in Islamic eschatology. Uh, the third one will be on that very important subject, the Jal on money. The fourth one, of course, which is going to step on some toes, because there's a lot of brainwashing in the world, will be on the Jal and women, the feminist revolution. And uh, the last one would be on the Jal, the Quran, and Akhiru Zaman, or the end of history. Uh, if you like, you can order pre-order your copy of my first book on Dajjal. Uh, you can go to my bookstore, uh, imranhussein.com, imranhussein.com, and pre-order a copy in English and in French of the book. Uh, it should be around 15 pounds if you're ordering from Europe and Britain and so on. But if you're ordering the book from other parts of the world, of course, the price would be cheaper. Um, so that's the news for this morning about my book, which is soon going to be printed. Uh, the second uh, uh, announcement I have to make before we begin today's session uh, is that uh, we are organizing, as I told you, a brainstorming session, uh, discussion session on uh, how to respond to the predicament of the imminent uh, demonetization of uh, paper money, no more paper money in the world, and uh, its replacement entirely with money you can't see, <laughs> money you can't touch, invisible money, intangible money, digital or electronic money, and you have to have the intellectual acumen of a donkey to recognize that as valid money. <laughs> yes. But many people in the world today, even with their PhDs in monetary economics, have been reduced to the intellectual acumen of a donkey. What can we do? But not you, my audience, mashallah, you recognize that this is a very dangerous moment in history. Uh, there was another moment about 100 years ago when the valid money was being replaced with monopoly money, this paper money. And the world of Islam did not respond at that time in the manner in which it ought to have responded. We failed and we failed miserably at that time in the 1940s when the Bretton Woods Accord took place and uh, the IMF came into being and so on. 
Islamic scholarship, Christian scholarship, Hindu scholarship, Jewish scholarship, they were doing something which in French is called fair dodo. <laughs> They're sleeping, but not today. At this time when the paper money is imminently, uh, is going to be removed imminently from the market and uh, we will have only digital money or electronic money. And it's an ex even more dangerous moment in time than the previous one. We need to respond. And this is what I've been doing. I've been giving my lectures. I've been conducting seminars for some time now. Uh, but here in my Caribbean island of Trinidad, we are organizing a brainstorming session, which is a private session, not public, it's private. Um, uh, and it will take place on November the 5th. It's also Yawmul Ahad, Sunday, at uh, 10.30 in the morning. Uh, and it will be held at the Jama Masjid uh, Hall in San Fernando, but you can only attend if you are invited to attend. You just can't walk in, sorry. You have to have your name there registered and we are, we are accepting you to attend, only then you can attend. You can come from abroad if you want. There are some people who have already indicated to me they're coming from abroad. I won't mention the countries, no. Uh, just send me an email if you'd like to attend. It probably is going to last a few hours, that's all, and then we have lunch and Salat al Zuhar and so on. And after Salat al-Zahar, we can continue the discussions if you want. So Sunday, November the 5th at uh, 10.30 in the morning, I'll have to drive up to IBN for the 9 to 10, and then uh, from, sorry, 8 to 9. And then after 9 o'clock, I'll have to drive back down to San Fernando, uh, which is about an hour's, an hour's drive to be there in time. So we start at 10.30. If you'd like to attend, Yes, do please just send me an email uh, or send an email to IBM or call an IBM and leave your contact number for the participating in the discussion session on an Islamic response to digital and electronic money on Sunday, November the 5th at 10.30 in the morning at the Jama Masjid Hall in San Fernando in my Caribbean island of Trinidad. And having said that now for today, we have a little <laughs> surprise for you. And that is that we are opening the lines today for you wherever you are, you in Trinidad or you are abroad. You can call so that we can have a discussion. We can have our own brainstorming session in public. Uh, of course, anonymous, your, your name will not be, will, will not be revealed. Uh, the numbers will be at the bottom of the screen. You can call from Trinidad, you can call from Tobago, you can call from abroad as well. And any time we receive a call, we'll inter interrupt the problem, right, program right away so we won't keep you waiting, inshallah. And uh, our subject will be to discuss how should we respond, uh, excuse me, to the imminent challenge of uh, electronic and digital money. Um, you're free to exp 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 um, ask questions, of course, but more importantly, we'd like to hear what do you have to say on the subject, inshallah. And uh, do, you, do you know of any, of scho any scholars of Islam anywhere in the world who are addressing the subject? And can you share with us what are their views and how do we respond. This is, as I said, one of the most dangerous moments in human history. For me, this is more dangerous than nuclear warfare. Nuclear warfare simply kills millions and millions, but this is slavery. This is slavery, yes. Um, the uh, money you can't see and money you can't touch, electronic money, uh, those who want to continue to fare dodo, fall asleep, or who are too scared, yes, they don't have backbones. They're men, <laughs> but they're still in short pants. They don't have backbones, they're afraid, and they don't want to discuss a subject that they consider to be dangerous. We have no time for them. No. We need a company of men who are men and women who are women, people who have 
fear for Allah and only Allah, and who in the pursuit of truth, in the pursuit, pursuit of justice in the world, and the truth should triumph over all rivals, they fear none but Allah. We need such people. And uh, today we invite you, wherever you are in the world, to call and exp explain your views. I know we didn't give you advance notice of this, so there are very few of you who are probably listening at this time. Um, but never mind, we can do it again next week. I still have another one month before I travel again, uh, so we should have another few programs before I leave Trinidad. Uh, and I'll be gone for a few months. I have to, I hope to visit Pakistan, inshallah, this time. And this will be my first visit to Pakistan in several years. Several years. But there's been a change uh, in Pakistan now, a favorable change. The Prime Minister had to resign because the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled against him on a matter pertaining to, to, um, to I believe it was corruption. Um, and so there's a favorable climate in Pakistan now, and I'm utilizing that opportunity to visit Pakistan, inshallah, when I travel this time in about a month from now. So now let us turn today to what I would like to share with you um, to help us, to help us in formulating our response. I've already taught the subject of money. I've already taught the subject of digital and electronic money. I'm not returning to that. I've already taught the monetary system. I'm not returning to that. I've not taught you enough of what is in the Quran and what is on the Sunnah uh, on digital money. But today what I'd like to do is to remind you that nothing happens in the Quran by accident. Remember, this is the last word from Allah. When Adam alayhi salam was expelled from Jannah, Allah said to him, he and his wife, that you must dwell on earth. وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حين. And here on earth there will be a, a habitat for you, a place of domicile. And you'll have sustenance for a period of time. وَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَى and while you are here on earth, my guidance will come to you. That my guidance will come to you from time to time. And if you follow my guidance, then you are okay. If you follow my guidance, you'll have no cause for fear and grief. And that guidance has come in the form of scripture, the book, and in the form of prophets. And these prophets have been coming, these messengers of Allah, these apostles have been coming who are, who are appointed by Allah, not appointed by the Vatican, or appointed by human beings, or appointed by society. No, 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 no. A messenger of Allah appointed by Allah. He appoints you. And we term, the Quran terms such a person as Nabi, Nabi. And uh, because he is sent by Allah, he is also called Rasul. Nabi is a prophet, Rasul, a messenger. It's the same thing, the two is the same thing. A person designated by Allah to come and to deliver guidance to the people. But now the last one is to come. The last prophet is to come. No more after him. No Nabi, no Rasul after him. And also he comes with the last book, the last revelation, no more after this. And so this must be a tremendously important. Book and care. This book. What does Allah choose to send down first when he sends down the book? He sent it down over a period of 23 years. Hmm? The first revelation came down when the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, was uh, 40 years of age. And uh, he was in the cave, in the Etikaf, in the mountain, 
and Allah sent down Ikra. Recite, read. Read this book. So this is the book which from the very beginning is, it tells you it must be recited, it must be read, it must be studied. And therefore, if you're not picking up the Quran every day and reciting the Quran, something is wrong. Yes. And if you're not teaching your children to pick up the Quran and to recite it every day, you are failing as parents. Remember that. And uh, the Quran cannot be translated into any other language. This is Imran Hussein talking. I am 75 years of age. I am one of the senior most scholars of Islam in this country at this time. I have had excellent teachers who taught me. I know something about the religion. And I say to you that the Quran cannot be translated. No. If you make an effort to translate the Quran as I did in the past, you're making a mistake. And I ask Allah to kindly forgive me. Kindly forgive me, Allah, for what I did in the past, attempting to translate the Qur'an. No. The Qur'an can only be explained. It can be interpreted. And you always say, Allah knows best. You are not attempting to translate. So the only Qur'an that exists is the Qur'an in Arabic. And the Qur'an itself means a book which is to be recited, Qur'an from Qara'ah. And so the beginning of the Qur'an is, this is the book to be recited. What about the end of the Qur'an, which is the last revelation to come down in the Qur'an? This cannot be by accident. Allah would choose with great, great care what is the last revelation he sends down. And I want in this today, in today's session, I want to share with you the last revelation to come down. While well, we wait for your calls, if you are listening and you would like to join in the discussion, excuse me. The Prophet ﷺ had performed the Hajj. It was the first and the last Hajj he ever performed. Uh, if he's alive today, I'm certainly he's not going to perform this Hajj. Oh, yes. So he performed the Hajj. And then Allah sent down revelation after he had performed the Hajj to declare that this day I have perfected your deen for you. I've completed my favor for you. And I've ordained for you as your way of life, the way of life of Islam or submission to Allah. So we assume naturally so that this is the last. Because the religion is perfected, the job is done. But no, this is not the last. Hmm. The Prophet والسلام, returned to the northern city of Yatrib, which after his death, after he died, then they renamed it Medina. While he was alive, they did not rename it Medina. While he was alive, Alive, the name remained Yatrib. He never changed it to Medina. Remember that. He always used the name Yatrib up to the moment he died. And after he died, the name was changed to Medina. The name in the Sunnah is Yatrib. The name in the Quran is Yatrib. Okay? So don't criticize me when I use the name Yatrib. The Prophet ﷺ returns to Yatrib. He has 81 days left in his life. And it is during these 81 days that the last revelation comes down. And what does it say? <laughs> the topic is riba. Yes, riba. Allah says, O oh, you who have faith in Allah, this is the explanation, not, into, not translation. O oh, you who have faith in Allah most high, Fear Allah, fear Allah, and give up your demand for riba. Give it up. What is this riba that he's talking about? And if you do not give up your demand for riba, 
if you do not give up these transactions in which you are engaged in riba, then take notice of a declaration of war from Allah and His Messenger. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If Allah is at war with some people who engage in something nasty, bad, dangerous conduct, and if the Prophet Muhammad is at war with them, and we are not at war with them, we are in plenty of trouble. Oh yes. Allah and His Messenger are waging war on them and we are sitting down and eating biryani and going to sleep. How can that be? Fear Allah and give up your demand for riba if you are indeed believers. And if you do not do that, then take notice of a declaration of war from Allah and His Messenger. The Security Council of the United Nations could say what they want. We don't care peanuts about that. If Allah declares war, then that's war. And if Prophet Muhammad declares war, we are at war. And if the Security Council says something else, we don't care two peanuts for the Security Council of the United Nations. Who do you think you are? World government? You are governing over the, over the whole world? Not at all. You cannot govern over the religion of Islam. Forget that. You cannot govern over the religion of Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. You cannot rule over the religion of Islam. No. Nope. And we say the same thing for Orthodox Christianity. You cannot rule over Orthodox Christianity. Forget it. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Then the verse continues. Allah explains. If you turn away from riba, then you are entitled to the principal sum. Oh, now we understand. Riba would be a loan on interest in which there is a principal sum which is lent and the principal sum is supposed to be returned with an additional amount. Today it's called interest. And I find it interesting that they should use the word interest. I don't know who coined the word interest and why they chose the word interest, but it's interesting. Yeah. But in the Quran, it's called riba. And in all English, it was called usury, but nobody uses the word usury anymore. It is a very, very, very dangerous sin to lend and to borrow money on interest. The Prophet والسلام, he cursed all four. And he said that they were all equally guilty. The one who takes riba, he lent money on interest. He put his money in a fixed deposit in the bank and he's taking the interest. He's a money lender like Shylock, a money lender. Lending money to that money will increase. The Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam cursed you. And the one who gives riba, he gives riba, meaning he borrowed the money. He, run, he has to run a business, shake him around, how can I run my business if I don't borrow money from the bank? Hmm? So he runs his business by borrowing on interest. He wants to buy a car, he borrows money on interest. Who cares to fig leaves about Islam, about Allah and his messenger, about the Quran? And we don't care. Two fig leaves about them. We want to live in this world. Fine, go ahead. Wait until the grave. <laughs> Wait until the grave and then you'll know about fig leaf. So he wants to buy a car. He wants to build a house. Well, the only way we could do it is to borrow money on interest. Don't you have any sense in your head, Sheikh Imran? Oh, you know. I remember the time when I was a child, when people had some sense in their head. 
and a man would build his house. Whenever he had money, he would build some more. And he'd build some more, and he'd build some more. And he had no money to put a door and a window, and they'd put a sugar bag before the plastic bags came. They used to have uh, jute bags. And he'd run the, put the jute bag on the window as a window, and the door as a door, until you got money to buy a door and buy a window, build a door and build a window. That's how people build their houses in the days when people had sense in their head. But now we have only peanuts in our head, and the only way you can build a house is you have to borrow money and interest from the bank, and then you have to spend the rest of 30 years like a jackass paying the bank. Yes. And in the process, you borrowed, <laughs> how much? You borrowed 500,000? And you're paying 1500000 A call from Charlieville. Yes, Charlieville? Hello? Yeah. Hello, yes? Mm -hmm. I'm listening. Yeah, we didn't speak with the Sheikh. Yes, I'm listening. Oh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. Sheikh, um, there's, um, there's information that... Um, Venezuela is selling oil to China for the yuan. And there's a suggestion by an economist in Trinidad that we trade with Venezuela with the, using the yuan. And um, we, we do a lot of purchases from China that we use the yuan to trade with China. And also, there's another indication that Saudi Arabia may be soon um, Purchasing or uh, selling oil to China for Iran. What are your views on this? Well, you have raised perhaps the most important question of all, Charlieville. Yeah. And you are certainly keeping in touch with the subject, and I mm -hmm. congratulate you for that because yeah. so many people are doing something what they call in French, fair dodo, they're sleeping. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, the evidence is as plain as daylight that uh, the, the, the petrodollar monetary system is on its way out. The challenge is now becoming irresistible, okay? Um, I believe that uh, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese um, initiative is meant to bypass the the IMF, because the, the articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund prohibit the use of gold as money. So what China is doing is saying, okay, we will buy your oil, and since China is the biggest, biggest um, purchaser buying oil from Saudi Arabia, China has overtaken the United States now. The Saudis had to be careful. This is your biggest customer talking. And the Chinese are saying, we are going to pay you with the Chinese currency, the yuan. And uh, when we pay you with the yuan, then you can then redeem that yuan for gold. So the Chinese are not in conflict with the IMF. They're skillfully avoiding being in conflict with the IMF. And uh, we will buy that gold in the market. So we're not going to use our reserves of gold to pay you for the oil. So our reserves of gold will become depleted. No, we want to keep our reserves of gold. And we'll, you'll be able to change your, you, sorry, redeem the yuan in the market for gold. Whatever the price of gold is in the market, we will pay and then you'll then be able to get your, your, your gold for your oil. And uh, this is a very admirable, admirable, admirable plan on the part of the Chinese. It has a lot of integrity in it. It had a lot of justice in it. And I will commend to the government of Trinidad and Tobago to negotiate an agreement with, um, not a negotiate agreement, but to study the subject and to see whether you can stand side by side with Venezuela in doing the same thing. But I don't know whether the government of Trinidad and Tobago has the strength 
and the courage and the backbone to do such a thing. Yes. Uh, there's a question from YouTube. Hello? 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 No, we don't have a question. Is the World War III, oh, that's your question. Is World War III coming? Um, I would have preferred if we could have stayed with the subject of money. Uh, but I'll just spend a minute with you on that question on World War, and then we return to the subject of money and to what is riba. Um, what the United States of America is doing now is they're fishing, fishing for some pretext with which they can cons have the Great War, the Middle World War. They want it. They want the World War. The stupid fools want a World War which will cause the deaths of 99% of all those who fight in the war. So all these people who work fighting in the U.S. Armed Forces are just like guinea pigs. They'll all die. Hmm? They'll all, but these who want the war, they don't care for you. Uh, they're fishing for a World War. They did it in the First World War, they did it in the Second World War, and they're now doing it again. They did it in Korea as well. They like to fish for a war. But one day, one day, Kongote, if you keep on fishing for a war, one day, one day, Kongote, you see what Allah will do with you one day. And that's what's coming to the United States. The United States is now in irrevocable decline. It doesn't matter to me if the U.S. Embassy in Trinidad and Tobago is displeased with me. I don't care two peanuts about your views. No. You wage war, miserable war on the truth, on injustice with all your false flag terrorism, and then telling me I'm a terrorist. We're not fools. No. The likely scenario now, it, the, the situation is evolving rapidly. The likely scenario will be Korea. Yeah. They will do something to provoke Korea, provoke Korea, provoke Korea, until eventually Korea will have to respond. And they're waiting for Korea to respond with an act, a military act. From the time Korea responds with a military response, that is the cue, and then they'll have the Great War. They will launch nuclear war on Korea. Korea will then launch, launch nuclear war on South Korea. Millions and millions will die in South Korea. Do they deserve that death? They should ask themselves whether they've been sensible or foolish in putting all their eggs in one basket. The U.S. basket. The U.S. don't care for you. No? So it's likely that this, the Third World War is going to start with fireworks in Korea. But I can be wrong. I've been wrong in the past. This is my view at, the time, at this time. Okay. We return now to our subject of money. And uh, Allah and his messenger are at war against the money lender. Remember that. And if Allah and his messenger are at war against the money lender, then we should be also at war. We should be struggling, struggling to eradicate riba. And Allah says, when you choose to get out of riba, the money lender is entitled to the principal sum. That is, you lend your money on interest, you can, you, you, you get back the principal sum plus an additional amount, that in the additional amount is riba or interest, and that is haram, is prohibited. Um, but if you want to give up the riba, then you are entitled to the return of the principal sum. That is what the verse is saying. If you give up your money lender, you can give up the riba, but you are entitled to the return of the principal sum which was lent. So this is riba, hmm? lending or borrowing money on interest. And Nabi Muhammad has cursed you. He's also cursed those who record the transaction, and he's cursed the witnesses, and he said they're all equally guilty. Now, let me tell you something that your Maulana probably never tells you. Your Darul Ulum probably will never tell you. If you have the curse of a prophet upon you, then you can perform your salat. It's not going to be accepted. 
If you have the curse of a prophet upon you, you can go perform Hajj, it will not be accepted. You can fast in Ramadan, it will not be accepted if you have the curse of a prophet upon you. You can give money in charity, it won't be accepted. Nothing, nothing, nothing will be accepted if you have the curse of a prophet upon you. Therefore, we have to formulate a proper response. How do we deal with the subject of riba? It is amazing, it's not talked. You can go and listen to the khutbah for Juma from now until eternity. You never hear a khutbah or a sermon on the Friday, on the Juma, on the subject of riba. No, nobody wants to explain the subject. They're scared of the subject. Yes. But this is not the only form of riba. But be, before we turn to the other form of riba, why has Allah prohibited money being lent on interest? Does he explain to us why? Before we scratch our head to find an answer, let's go in the Quran and see whether the Quran gives an answer. Hmm? In the Quran, Allah gives at least two answers. He says, first of all, وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَا Allah has made business halal, but he's made riba haram. He makes a contrast between business and riba, or money lending, on interest. He says, this is halal, but this is haram. So what's the difference between a business transaction and a riba transaction? That is the question. Do you understand? The question is, what is the difference between a business transaction and a riba transaction? How do they differ with each other? Which explains why this one is halal and this one is haram. The answer is, here is the answer, that a business transaction is a transaction in which there is always an element or a factor of risk, R-I-S-K, you're taking a chance, risk. You can either make a profit or you can suffer a loss. Every businessman knows that. So a good businessman will study the market to try to achieve an informed judgment on the market. Uh, so that I'm not taking too great a risk, but I cannot avoid a risk. No. A good business transaction is one in which, yes, I know there's, a, there's an element of risk, but all the other factors are there making this likely to be a successful business. Once there is the element of risk, however, then Allah can enter into the market and take from some and give to others. He can cause you to have a loss and he can cause him to, suffer, to have profit. So he can take from some and give to others. So wealth will not remain concentrated only amongst the wealthy. Allah can cause the distribution of wealth and the redistribution of wealth by taking from some and giving to others. Governments are not supposed to distribute and redistribute wealth. When they do so, they make a mistake, they make a mess of it, and they fill their pockets with money. Well then, what about the riba transaction? The reason why a riba transaction does not qualify as a business transaction, listen carefully, is because the money lender wants to eliminate the possibility of loss. He wants to immunize himself from any possibility of loss. The money lender wants to get his pound of flesh secure without any possibility of loss. That's why I love William Shakespeare. 
the greatest sheikh of all of Britain is William <laughs> Shakespeare. And his book, The Merchant of Venice, explains the subject of riba to perfection. Ah, yes, perfection. The Merchant of Venice, because he called it a pound of flesh. The moneylender wants a pound Shylock. Shylock, this was what the Jews were doing. And Shakespeare was absolutely correct in pronouncing Shylock's conduct, who was a Jew, to be deplorable and morally reprehensible and unjust. And uh, he denounced it. So the Riba transaction does not qualify as a business transaction because the money lender lends on the condition that come rain or come sunshine, you have to return his money to him with an additional amount. He is secure in getting that additional amount. There is no possibility of loss. He, he ensures that he gets his pound of flesh because he has something like a mortgage. He takes something as collateral. So if you cannot repay, he sees your property. Yes, he sees your property. This is uh, money lending. And this is one form of riba. And when an economy is based on money lending, on interest riba, then wealth no longer circulates through the economy. No. The rich will remain permanently rich forever and ever and ever and ever. And the poor will not only remain permanently poor forever and ever and ever and ever, but they'll grow increasingly poorer and poorer and poorer and poorer until they become slaves. When you have debts and you cannot repay them, you're in slavery. You are in slavery. They will do all kinds of things to you do to ensure that you lose your freedom when you have debts and you cannot repay your debts. Yes. So this is one form of riba. But in the Quran, Allah speaks of another form of riba. And to recognize the other form of riba in the Quran, we need to go to the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, because he was sent to teach the Quran. And he explained to us the other form of riba which I have also explained in previous lectures, that is a, tra a transaction which is based on deception. A transaction which is based on deception, which yields a profit or a gain greater than that which to which one is justly entitled, is riba. The Americans have a nice term for it, they call it a rip-off. Yes, a ripoff. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, and you buy his goods from him before he could enter into the market, and when he enters into the market, he finds that he could have gotten a better price. That, said the Prophet, Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, is riba. You exploited his ignorance of the market price to enter into a transaction with him in which you ripped him off. When he went into the market and he found that he was, he was ripped off, he wouldn't want to do business with you again. He wouldn't even want to shake hands with you again. That's not the way business should be transacted. Listen to me if you're a businessman. Listen to me. The Quran says, Don't rip off people. You must do business in such a way that there is mutual satisfaction. So when that man does business with you and he is satisfied and you are satisfied, he will always want to come back with, to you to do business with you, particularly if you have a motor car garage. That's where the report takes place. If you have a garage and you are a mechanic and you fix his car for him and you charge him a price which is reasonable and he is satisfied with the job and the price, even if the man moves to live far away, he still drives to come to you, to your garage. Why? Because he trusts you now. 
And when someone trusts you in business, they will trust you in other things as well. That's why when Muslim businessmen, Arabs, went to in Southeast Asia as businessmen, the way they did business in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Thailand and these places, it so impacted upon the local people that these were people we could trust. You can't trust the United States, the government of the United States that tell monstrous lies. Would you trust them? So these are people you can trust. And when you can trust him with business, you can trust him with truth as well. That's why they all became Muslims. That's why they all became Muslims, yes. So if you deceive someone in a business transaction and rip him off, that is riba. Let me repeat the hadith. If you are fair, dodo, listen to me. If you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, and you buy his goods from him before he could enter into the market. And when he enters into the market, said the Prophet ﷺ, he finds that he could have gotten a better price in the market. That is riba. Now when we go to the Qur'an, Allah speaks to us about the market at the time of Shu'aib salam and how people were being ripped off in that market. And he destroyed them, yes. And three times in the Quran, Allah has given a command. He says, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ بَقْسِ Do not diminish people's property. Do not diminish people's wealth. Do not diminish the value of people's labor. Make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Ripping them off. There's a call from Charlieville, okay. Hello? Hello? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam. Sheikh? Yes? Um, could we make an analogy concerning riba with the hadith on um, alcohol in that Alcohol, the name will be changed and people will consume. In, um, so riba, the analogy is that the name will be changed and it, people will try to make it halal. And we have an institution in Trinidad, an Islamic institution, that doesn't seem to be getting off the ground at all. Is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not bless such transactions? Your views, please. Well, I, I'm not sure whether uh, a link can actually be made. I'm not sure whether a, a link can actually be sure. Hello? I'm saying that I'm not sure whether a link can actually be made between the revelations pertaining to alcohol and the revelations pertaining to riba. But I remember writing in my book something on the subject, but I just can't remember it now. I just can't remember you. I'll forgive me about that. If you go to my book entitled The Quranic Method of Curing Alcoholism and Drug Addiction, in that book I made uh, some comments on the link between alcohol and riba. I Sorry, I can't remember it now. 75 years of age, eh? Okay. Um, the Muslim Credit Union in Trinidad and Tobago uh, has been attempted for a long, long time now to try to get off the ground, and no matter how much I try to explain to them, they don't want to listen to me. They've been engaged in riba without calling it riba. Uh, something called morabaha, you know, you, you are... You, you want to buy a house and you can't afford to buy it cash, so you go to the credit union. And the credit union will say, no problem, we'll buy the house for $1 million cash, and then we sell it to your credit for $2 million or $3 million. <laughs> And because both parties know the, the, what they call it, markup. I don't know where they get the term from, markup. They call it markup the profit margin. This is, you're buying for one, you're selling for three. You're buying for one, you're selling for three. Huh? 
and it's a credit transaction, this is Morabaha. It's not Morabaha, it's Riva. If you are selling it cash, you're buying it one million cash, you're selling it three million cash, okay. But the fellow who buying it for three million cash, get him to get an appointment with a psychiatrist. Yes. Stop the nonsense. If you're buying cash and you're selling cash, then tell the fellow to get an appointment with a psychiatrist and get his head fixed. Because he got only peanuts in his head. Why should he buy cash for three million when he can buy cash for one million? You think we are fools? No. The reason why he's buying for three million when it is on sale for one million is because he's buying credit, not cash. The difference between the credit price and the cash price is riba. But they call it markup. But wait until they go in their grave and then they'll know. Wait until they go in their grave and then they'll know. They don't want to listen to Imran who's saying now, never mind, never mind, never mind you and your morabaha. Wait until you go in your grave and then you will know. Yes. So this is why they can't get off the ground. There's no baraka in that. A call from Monroe Road, yes? Hello? Hello, Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you doing, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Okay, well, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, for the longest while, I've been trying to uh, pre um, defer from taking a loan from the bank. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, one of my reasons, my main reason, uh, because the bank, all the money in the bank is interest money from the Federal Reserve, um, is, it, is it wrong to take this loan from the bank? Because basically what we are doing, we are accepting RIBA in, in exchange for this, for, for this money. We are, we are mm. accepting RIBA mm. so that we can get this money mm. to, buy, to buy whatever we need, what yeah. we think we need. Mm. And finally, the bank that we're going to is a Jewish guy that owns this bank, or a Jewish organization, mm. or a Zionist organization that mm. owns this bank. Mm. So then, and then I'm going to these people to mm. tell them that I, will, I am willing to pay them interest because I need this item. Mm. So is, that, is that the right way of thinking okay. of it, or no. am I, do I have the wrong concept? No, the first thing is, if you have to begin from the beginning. And uh, uh, you have to ask whether or not the money which is now being used is halal or haram. Unfortunately, the subject is not taught in the Darul Ulum. I went to Darul Ulum Newcastle in um, South Africa. Uh, we have a, gra a graduate of Darul Ulum Newcastle here in Monroe Road, a young man here. I met him. Uh, but he was, he was not there when I went to lecture at Darulum, Newcastle. Molana Sima was alive at that time, he was there. And I lectured before the Darulum with all the staff, the students, uh, on the subject of Islam and the international monetary system for two hours or more. Molana Sima sat down for the whole lecture. And at the end of the whole lecture, he came and he hugged me. And he said to me, we have to teach this subject in the Darul Room. Unfortunately, Molana Sima was about 85 years of age. He's died. May Allah have mercy on him. What a wonderful man he was. I love him very much. They don't teach the subject in the Darul Room, so they don't know. That's why. And they're giving fatwa. Mogas fatwa. And they wouldn't listen to me. Wait. 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 I'm warning you. You wait and you see what's going to happen. You're not listening to me. This is not arrogance on my part. You are my brothers and I love you, but I'm fell up. I fell up. I waited long enough and you will not listen. You are arrogant. You will not listen. You believe you are right, so wait and see what's going to happen. If you consider the paper money to be halal, then it is right. It's okay for people to take paper and say, kaba, 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 whatever it is, and they become money. And they give to it a fictitious value and that's halal money for you. If that is halal, then you can do anything with it. But I say it's haram. So the first transaction of the issuance of the money is haram. Borrowing the money on interest is a haram transaction. So how can one haram and two haram make a halal? No, I don't think that's a right, proper way in which to pr proceed uh, with the subject. The better way would be for you to uh, come and join us on the 5th of November when we meet. Uh, but you must first send me an email to be invited. You can't just walk in. No, it's a private gathering. Um, 
so we can sit down and put our heads together here in Trinidad to discuss, well, what do we do? What do we do? And I have some ideas to, show, to, to, to share with you on the subject that is that we must start minting dinar and dirham, gold and silver coins. I have studied the subject, I've lectured on the subject, I've written books on the subject, but I'm the only voice talking about dinar and dirham. Where are the others? What are they? They're fair and dodo, sleeping all the time. So if we start minting, if the temple in Jerusalem minted gold and silver coins, Nabi Isa al-Islam was there, and he's a prophet of Allah, then we can also mint dinar and dirham in the masjid. If the temple in Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa, if they minted dinar and dirham, we can do the same thing here. It's halal for us to do it. Yes. And I don't think the government of Trinidad and Tobago will be so foolish to intervene to stop us. One last question before we end. We have a minute left. Will the United States strike Iran after breaking the Iran deal to prevent Iran from developing nuclear missiles to reach Israel? Can Iran resist USA militarily? No, I think the United States is shadow boxing with Iran. There will not be a war with Iran. No, I think the war will be with um, Korea. More likely that they will provoke Korea because the Iranian military is not under the control of Rouhani. The Iranian military is under the control of Ayatollah Khamenei. And Ayatollah Khamenei is a man of great integrity, and great knowledge, and great uh, wisdom. He is an admirable leader. Ayatollah Khamenei, I have great, great respect for that man, yes. So I don't think you can, you can win, start a war with Iran so easily, no. Um, the, the United States is going to become uh, isolated now because Europe is parting from the United States on the subject of the uh, Iran uh, nuclear agreement. Um, I oppose the agreement in the beginning, yes, but we don't have time now to talk about that. Thank you. Until next week, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.